Hi there. My name is Chris Johnson, the Vice President of Advancement here at Denver Seminary. Been working here for about 13 years, and basically what advancement means, I'm really in charge of fundraising, as well as uh, just helping the business operations of Denver Seminary work. So thank you for joining us today. I'm going to kind of go through a couple announcements first, and then um, later on have our guests um, join us. So uh, I'll do a description of today's panel event in perspective, the place and power of liturgy. The word liturgy originates from a Greek term meaning work of the people. In today's day and age, what does liturgy truly mean? How can we practice liturgy within our communities and everyday lives? Together, we will explore the richness and limitations of liturgy, as well as its intentionality and purpose. Join us as we address the mysteries and practical applications of liturgy individually and corporately. So again, thanks for joining us. A couple of things I'm going to highlight before we get into kind of the guidelines of today. Um, we have two exciting events we want to make you aware of. First is our Legacy Builders Breakfast. We, it's both virtual and in-person options, 7 a.m. till 9 a.m. preparing airs. As you can see, it's Thursday, October 12th. Um, and it's a father and son duo, Greg and Pete have collectively served the Denver community for over 45 years as financial advisors, walking alongside families and individuals to help them achieve their financial goals. So they're going to talk about different things such as, um, the true wealth transfer from baby boom, baby boomers and, and have a lively discussion. So we hope you can join us for that event. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight also James Ryder, which will highlight a place to, um, where you can find sign up for the events, but James Ryder is james.ryder at denverseminary.edu is his email address in case you have any questions. Um, we do have a prospective student preview day. So I want to encourage even our alum, alumni who are participating today, if you want someone to come learn about Denver Seminary, if you're local, um, there's also online avenues as well this way. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about Denver Seminary and the programs we offer, we want to invite you to attend one. Preview days for anyone interested in learning more about how becoming a student is like at Denver Seminary. You have a chance to meet our admissions team, our financial aid teams, um, meet some uh, faculty and have lunch with them as well. So anyways, you can see the information there, but what I really want you to both, if anybody's interested in either one of those two events, go to denverseminary.edu slash events and you're able to register in those places. So, okay, so, so directions for today. Um, we will not be using the raise the hand feature. Um, this is more of a webinar event. Um, we will, uh, or the chat feature, you cannot use that as well. You can submit questions to the Q&A and I'll manage those at the bottom of the screen. And you can also upvote if you really like a question that you thought would be a good one for me to ask. Um, there's no way we'll get to all the questions, but I want you to, I want to encourage you to send them in as well. Um, we'll do the best ones to combine some the questions or ask the most relevant ones that we feel like are the right appropriate ones for this Q&A format. So um, I want to invite our participants at this point to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. Um, I'm going to introduce Scott Winnig and then I'll let in Scott introduce our panelists. But Scott joined the faculty at Denver Seminary in 1994. I know he's our graduate, uh, had taught adjunct beforehand even. He is an MA in, um, or he's a professor of applied theology, teaching in the area of homiletics, church history, leadership, and pastoral ministry. So obviously he's a perfect candidate for this kind of platform that we're going to do today. Also, you're a pastor at Bear Valley Church, I know, for many years. Uh, um, also served the senior teaching pastor at Aspen Grove, Colorado Community Church for five years. Um, I won't list all the journals he's participated in, but I, I calculated there was 12 plus, Scott, that you've been reading in different journals. But the part I love is that you're just a faithful advocate for us, the local church, and he is the most encouraging human being you're going to come across. Every time you walk away from Scott one day, he makes you feel like a million bucks. So thank you, Scott, for hosting this, taking your time to do this, and I'll let you introduce our panelists. So, uh, Chris, thanks so much for your very kind comments. Love <laughs> you. Love your team. Love Denver Seminary. Uh, friends, I am just thrilled to be here with three friends of mine, Chris Hess, Zach Hicks, and Katie Gale. And so before we get going on talking about liturgy, I want us to get to know each of them. So Katie, I'm going to start with you. And would you just take a minute or two or however long you'd like and tell us about yourself, 
uh, your ministry context and kind of your background. And uh, then we'll go to Chris Hess and then eventually wrap up with Zach. And then we'll get talking about liturgy. So Katie, kick yeah, us off. Please. Thank you. Um, I'm an almost native of Colorado. Colorado natives are feel very strongly about this, but I moved here when I was two. And I've lived in Colorado the rest of the time. Uh, did not grow up in a Christian home. I came to faith in college. I went to CU Boulder, go Buffs. Amen. And found <laughs> Jesus in this really interesting, cool place. Um, and did not come to faith in a liturgical uh, church setting, but in a wonderful college ministry and then a really large um beautiful church, but very non-denominational. Uh, I went to high school with my husband, Jeff, and we've now been married 14 years. And we have two little kids, a five-year-old and a two and a half-year-old. And I came to Wellspring, which is an Anglican church, when I was a student at Denver Seminary. So I went to Denver Seminary from 2010 to 2013 to get my MDiv. We were kind of looking for a church. Um, we're invited to this Anglican charismatic liturgical church. What is that? Um, and just really fell in love with this tradition. And so I've been on staff of this church community for 13 years, just about 13 years and in a variety of roles. Um, but I got ordained eight years ago as an Anglican deacon. So in our tradition, our clergy wear collars. And uh, I currently serve as our executive pastor of ministry. So really leading and shepherding our staff uh, and the congregation. And I might add that uh, you preach on occasion. And as somebody who loves preaching and teaches preaching, I'm always encouraged to hear about your preaching ministry as well. Thank you. I do really love to preach. So grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, well, God bless you. Chris Hess, brother, tell us all about yourself, please. Thanks so much, Katie. Hey there. Uh, I'm Chris. I am a Colorado native, born and raised, age zero. <laughs> um, I grew up in Colorado Springs, and I moved up to Fort Collins for college at CSU, the Rams. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, I've been up in Fort Collins ever since, since 2000. I met my wife up here at CSU. We have four kids. Uh, I also didn't grow up in the church and did end up being a pastor for around 15, 16 years up here in Fort Collins at a church in Old Town. And it was a space where we gradually discovered liturgy. Uh, there are a few just moments in my life where I can remember the revised common lectionary coming across my universe for the first time and being like, what is this? And it feels like home. Um, and then watching in our congregation liturgy just kind of emerge that was authentic to who we were as a very neighborhood facing congregation. And yeah, liturgy is just a, a word, a thing that feels like home to me and that I love so much. And I look at it kind of like jazz where it's like, here's the, here's the key and here's the time signature. And let's go be creative and all of the smooths. So uh, that's what that's what I have going on. I'm currently the director of the Soul Care Initiative at Denver Seminary. And what that looks like is helping to run programs and raise money with the guidance of Chris Johnson to keep those programs going that serve leaders across the front range of Colorado. Uh, Lots of folks, leaders who, you know, are tired or worn out uh, and are looking for that, that, uh, how does Eugene put it in the message, the, the unforced rhythms of grace again in their lives. So we have programs that serve those folks and I wouldn't, I don't want to be anywhere else. So it's great to be here. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, Chris, at some point down the road, if I don't get to this, I want you to make sure you interject from your experience and observation, the connection between liturgy and spiritual formation and soul care. So I'll try to get to that, but if I don't, I'm going to put that back on you to weigh in. So let's go to our friend, Zach Hicks. Zach, so good to see you, brother. Tell us about yourself and what you're doing right now, please. I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, and lived there for all 18 years until graduating high school, ended up in California for college, and then Denver for seminary and the start of my ministry. I was ordained and have, and remain ordained in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. 
And uh, in the midst of that, it's taken me all over the country. I've now lived in Fort Lauderdale, Miami area, and now I'm currently serving in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm a church planter with the EPC. But along the way, uh, did stints in the Episcopal Church, serving what we call out of bounds um, in a cathedral in downtown Birmingham. And that was my time in residence in the Anglican tradition. Um, a lot of my scholarship and a lot of my reflection as someone who straddled the worlds of worship leading and pastoral ministry have been processing the intersection of, of worship and liturgy and liturgical life, along with what happens when we gather together. My wife's name is Abby. We've been married for over 20 years. We've got four kids, three boys and a girl, 18, uh, 16, 14, and 13. So they're getting older and I'm tired. <laughs> Yeah, you and Abby are living in your van as God intended, taking kids all over the place. Hey, so right. good to have you, brother. All right, friends, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on these questions, and you just take your time and unpack them as you want, uh, according to the uh, leading of the Lord and and uh, what's on your heart and your mind. Um, Chris defined liturgy first off when he kicked us off, and he said, liturgy historically comes from a Greek word, which means work of the people. But from your perspective, I'd like each of you to weigh in and say, hey, Here's what liturgy means to me. Here's how I define it, or here's how we define it in our church context. Katie, once again, let's start with you. You kick us off, please. Yeah, we a couple of years ago, we had a person attending Wellspring who was a watchmaker, and he described liturgy as thoughtfully assembled, which as a mm -hmm. watchmaker, that's what you're doing. So we think about it a lot like that, that liturgy is thoughtfully assembled, and it is the work of the people, the, the worship of the people. Um, but uh, not just, oh, this one liturgical prayer, but but I would really see it comprehensively in the Eucharistic liturgy. So as we gather together corporately, I think that there's something really powerful about corporate communal worship in liturgy, and we're retelling the story of the gospel. And that's what we're doing in our liturgy um, from the beginning to the end of who is God and who are we as the people of God. And so our corporate worship or corporate liturgy is very thoughtfully assembled in uh, in how we're acclaiming God and being formed as the people of God. That's great. I'm going to come back here in a minute. And I'll ask you to tell us what that looks like week in and week out at Wellspring, but let me go to Chris Hess and have him unpack it from his perspective a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Katie, thank you for just teaching me like four things. <laughs> As you just, yeah. um, right, right, it's so succinct. Um, liturgy for, for me and in my historical context and current context, not currently pastoring a traditional congregation, is, um, you know, it's this congregational voice that attunes us all to one another and what one another is going through and living in life in common practice. And also attunes all of us to the voice of God that anchors and centers us through the rest of our week. And so liturgy for me has always been in, the, especially in that congregational context, um, a reminder of who we are and a reminder of whose we are so that we remember that together so we can carry it through the rest of the week into everything that we do and you know using historical prayers or or using practices that come up in our congregational context uh there's just a a thing around really saying this prayer that has been said for centuries and centuries and uh, joins us to you know the cloud of of saints so uh, that is liturgy to me. It's a lot of things. And that is my scattershot at the wall. Okay, that's great. Well, we'll try to come back and unpack some of those. Uh, Zach, uh, you and I are both preachers like Katie and and uh, Chris has been a preacher. I, Because I'm a preacher, I always like to try to go easy on preachers, but I'm kind of hard on worship leaders. <laughs> You're one of the best worship leaders I've ever seen or mm. sat under. And I had the privilege of uh, sitting under your ministry at Cherry Creek Press for I think almost four years, and you were awesome. And you're a Presbyterian, but who's worked in an Anglican context. 
given your background, tell us how you define liturgy, brother. Yeah, if I'm setting aside uh, kind of history and etymology, and I'm just talking about the way that is most common to what we throw around around here, usually when we're talking broadly about liturgy and being liturgical, we're talking about that sphere of conversation that has to do with the form and content of a worship service. And in that sense, all worship traditions are liturgical. All worship traditions have rituals and things they do. Even the spontaneous charismatic ones have rituals uh, that they engage in. And if I'm just thinking more narrowly, sometimes we throw around that word simply to mean worship services that have um, set prayers, responsive elements and things that are prescribed that happen in a ritualistic faction and over and over again, over time and over weeks. Great. Wow. That's good. Appreciate that, friend. Okay. I'm going to ask each of you to describe what the liturgy of your contemporary context looks like. So Katie, you'll talk about Wellspring and then Chris, you can talk about the church you pastored and then we'll come back and have Zach tell us what it looked like maybe in the Anglican church he was part of and then the church plan he's doing. So Katie, go ahead, please. Yeah, so we are part of the Anglican communion worldwide. And so um, what's beautiful about being in a large denomination is the liturgy that we are going to participate in is not something that we're just coming up with every week, but it's housed in a larger tradition. And it, it grounds us historically and globally, which has come to be really meaningful for me. Um, but I would say our, our liturgy, um, the way that we engage it, has four main chapters. Uh, and the first begins with gather. We gather together in worship. And the first words that we proclaim as a community are praise. What is the purpose of our gathering? We're here to praise the Lord. And so this, the gathering of praising the Lord and also having our hearts exposed to him as we come into worship. Um, that's our first movement. The second movement is the word. And so in our liturgy, the word is read, um, it depends on the Anglican church. We typically only do two readings, but you might go somewhere that has four readings. So we're just read, preached, prayed, and then we confess you know, as the as the word of God is, um, you know, convicted us. That's the second movement. The third movement is the table. So we always come to the table to receive. Uh, and there's a lot of liturgical prayers or prayers that we participate in together in the table. And then after we receive, we always are sent out. That's the fourth movement of our service is sending. And so we we say, thank you for feeding us. You know, we've received from you. Now send us out to do the work you've given us to do. And then we, there's a lot of yelling and hallelujahs. And, um, <laughs> and our, our, uh, our Anglican tradition, I don't know so much how much someone knows about the Anglican history of this country, but we've been very influenced by the African Anglican church. So several of our liturgical prayers come from Africa. So we throw our, we use our whole bodies in prayer. We throw our sins at the cross. We shout. Um, and depending on the church season, the, the prayers or the order of prayers may change a little bit um, or the posture of prayer. You know, if it's Lent, it's going to feel different than resurrection. But the movements of our lit of our liturgy will always be the same. Gather, word, table, send. Great. Thank you so much. Chris? Yeah. So we were a very non-denominational space with a lot of folks who were arriving, carrying a lot. I mean, just wounds, a lot of people. And the for the rhythm of liturgy, was just healing for folks, you know? And I mentioned it once already where uh, being a not, in a non-denominational space, it just kind of arose. We we noticed these things coming up. Uh, and so it would, I mean, similar to what Katie said, we'd begin with welcome. You know, well, we purposely started five minutes after the posted time to allow for time for folks to catch up. And then we would welcome the Trinity with lighting of candles and a prayer. That was wow. the same every week. Okay. Uh, and then uh, other elements were song and the word. We had a practice that came up that occurred every week called recognition of souls, which I learned later. A friend of mine who came from uh, the Presbyterian church was like, in other places, we just call this passing the peace. And I'm just like, oh, what's that? So, <laughs> you know, but it was the opportunity to look around the room and recognize that we had all arrived in that space through different weeks 
and days and mornings and lifetimes, but we were all there. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, there was the sending out with the benediction that was written over the course of a few years and altered here and there, the same every week, and all said together. So a very, like, we we weren't rooted in the Anglican tradition or the Presbyterian tradition or Episcopalian tradition or any of the, the more liturgical traditions. And I can remember one time, you used the word movement, Katie. Um, we we used to call these things, our, uh, these special services that we do are movement services that would have these very blocked off sections. And then one time I was in a place and I went through something like that, that was being led by someone else. And they're like, that was a liturgy. And I was like, oh, okay. And that's when it all started, started to click <laughs> for us. So there's my brief history and experience. Great. Thanks so much. Zach? Yeah, so Sunday mornings at Church of the Cross kind of look like a meeting ground between uh, charismatic modern worship sensibilities when it comes to music and experience with uh, what I would describe as kind of themes and variations on the Book of Common Prayer, both of which are a bit of a stretch for the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition because of our love-hate relationship with uh, with liturgy and our fondness for worship coming from the heart and being uh, from extemporaneous speaking, praying, preaching, those sorts of things. Um, and that gives us a bit more freedom than it does in the Anglican tradition where your prayer, prayer book is prescribed for you. But if I had to say what our liturgy was doing in its movement, it was uh, while we go through set prayers and um, confession and assurance and those sorts of things, it's interspersed and underlaid with music so that we're kind of singing our way in the gaps of all these things. Um, and I would describe us trying to accomplish what Cranmer set out to do with the original prayer books, which was to move the people of God through multiple cycles of repentance, through multiple cycles of acknowledging our need for Jesus, and then receiving uh, the gift that is Jesus in his gospel. So um, there's kind of two broad sections of that that's part of maybe historic Christian worship that I do think characterize our two-part liturgy, which is we sort of describe it as liturgy of the word or liturgy of the scriptures. So where the, in a sense, the culmination of that is preaching and we're working our way towards that as we sing, pray and read scriptures uh, and then the sermon. And then the second half is the liturgy of the upper room or uh, the liturgy of the table. So that means that we are celebrating the Lord's Supper every week. And in both sections, the Lord through his word is doing the work of, uh, I sort of call open heart surgery, uh, bre breaking us open to expose our need for Jesus and then giving us Jesus in the power of his spirit. Uh, and we come to do that ritualistically, but experientially so that maybe we know how to live repentant lives Monday through Saturday. Thanks. You gave us a really, really good overview of what you do at your church. And you mentioned Cranmer. <laughs> He's one of my heroes because that's my research field. I think you're absolutely right in what terms of what he was trying to do. And he was trying to move people out of medieval Catholicism into a reformed perspective on the Christian faith. So let me ask each of you, and this is a harder question. Why are you doing liturgy in your church the way you're doing it? Why? Why that? Why now? Well, we're doing it because we're walking in the tradition of Cranmer. As okay, from, yay. <laughs> from the you. Yeah. Reformation. Um, yeah, love you know, that. That's where we now are. And we, we don't have a, you know, what we say as Anglicans, uh, it's not that first we have a theology book, we have a prayer book. And that our prayer is what, what leads and guides us. And then now we're um, connected, rooted to the historic church, but then also now globally as we're part of, Anglicans worldwide, 90 million Anglicans worldwide, worldwide. I think we're also doing liturgy the way that we do it because we believe it actually forms us to be people of God, to be the people of God. Um, and, you know, Chris, you use the word healing and how much liturgy, you saw liturgy as, as being a place of healing. And, and we see that for so many people. It is a place where people truly, um, 
encounter the Lord, encounter the spirit. And there's a lot of healing that takes place as we participate together. So uh, probably there's a lot of reasons why uh, we do liturgy the way that we do it. That's great. Thanks. Chris, it sounds like that the liturgy at the church you pastored kind of came up from the from the people, so to speak. Uh, why did you structure things the way you eventually did? What led you to do it that way? Sure. And I think, yes, I will just answer the question. Um, it was it was the hoped for fruit of it is that it would set a certain sort of rhythm apart. That, you know, if we came crashing into Sunday mornings uh, in our practice of congregation, that a rhythm would be encountered that was both intentional and a little different than what we were just encountering as we moved through our day to day, right? Um, and so it was sort of that set apart space. And then the question, what was always held was, what does the neighborhood re need right now? And the neighborhood could be the congregation on Sunday mornings or the people right. we interfaced with during the week, right? And so that was what always was informing the practices of our Sunday mornings together and, and what slotted into those rhythms. And that's okay. the same, I think, in formation and soul care, which we can talk about later. Yeah, I want to get to that, but thank you so much. Zach, I mean, you talked about Cramer a little bit. What, why are you doing things at your church the way you're doing them right now? Yeah, in addition to kind of the experiential, informative um, things that were mentioned before, there's a missional reason at this, at this present juncture that uh, especially our church is new and um, our unreached people group that the Lord is calling us to bear witness to are people uh, largely who've been burned by the church. Mm -hmm. And a lot of ways that people express being burned by the church or disillusioned by it or having kind of dismantled the house of their faith, a lot of that has to do with the way the the church has maybe taken things like uh, worship and in a sense, improvised without uh, necessarily a lot of reflection or improvised with a lot of just the individual personality of whoever's at hand to lead it. And one of the gifts of liturgy, among the uh, other things in the liturgical tradition, is a kind of safety that, that some feel in a space like ours when they know that Zach didn't come up with this stuff. Uh, there's a, there's a, a comfort in this present cultural moment when people uh, feel like uh, this stuff is tethered to something older than all of us. And that's very, I, I mean, I would say it's psychologically calming. It's assuring and uh, it offers a kind of stability that's experienced as such. And so for us, it's a, it's a missionary reason uh, to, in a sense, get out of the way and not let our, our personalities or plans dictate how worship goes. And, and there is a sense in which when people come and they experience that, that is one of their takeaways. I, I feel a sense of trust and I even feel a sense of um, emotional health in this because it sounds like uh, the kinds of things that you're doing have been pulled from a lot of a different people's reflection and experience that transcends any one person's talent or persona. Yeah, it sounds like from your description, part of the reason that you're doing liturgy the way you're doing it is because then it's not so dependent on who's ever up front, either leading worship or preaching or, you know, doing the welcome or whatever else, but rather there's a structure where, you know, you can have different people up front, but the, the flow of the service still looks the same because it's rooted in the past. Um, can I add me, something, Dr. Go, Winnick? Please go, go, go. Add in. Well, yes. I, I, for, I agree with that, Zach, so much. And I, I think what's been interesting, you know, there's so many trends as you read about the church and young people leaving the church and, you know, in the next 30 years, how many, you know, 18 to 25 year olds will leave the church. And we're just, we're seeing this large group of young 20 somethings um, coming and it's because they want liturgy. They want to be engaging in liturgy for, for those reasons. They want it to feel like they're rooted in truth and biblical truth and, you know, um, the history of the saints. And, and then it's, so it's, it's this like beautiful intergenerational worship that we get to, to engage in together. That's not just dependent upon one person. So it's been beautiful to see that. Well, I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said. Uh, my observation is over the last 10 plus years, there is this growing popularity of what we might call more liturgical or 
from where I come from, from the free church tradition, more of a high church approach to worship on Sunday. Uh, why, why is that becoming popular or why has it become popular? What's going on with that? What, what, what's it touching in the cultural moment, you might say? Feel free yeah, to weigh in. I think we're living in the, the wasteland of the negative consequences of the church growth movement. And even going back to some of the philosophy that's in our DNA from the second great awakening of the kind of win the loss at any cost approach to planning and leading worship services that anything goes and we don't need to reflect on um, the formative import of whatever we're doing in our worship services. And on the other side of maybe a couple generations now, having grown up in the purely contemporary church, we might say, as a result of those 80s and 90s church growth movements, there's a hunger for what is lacking there. There's a hunger for depth, historical connectivity, um, a kind of uh, a story beyond myself, uh, a connection to Christians who have gone before me. There's a desire to move away from things that are, are deemed manipulative and hype-based towards something that's more substantive. Um, and I do think that the people who are becoming adults in this generation are, are feeling that lack and are finding something fulfilling about these traditions. And for them, it's not uh, it's not dead tradition. It's something they've never experienced and are are coming to a well that they didn't know existed or could be a part of their Christian faith because they simply weren't given it. Great. Good. Thanks. Chris, would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah. Yes. Because like the things that, that Zach and, and Katie have said, they're making my heart beat faster, which is always <laughs> a great sign, right? Good. Um, it is... Like, yes, just riffing on the wisdom that's already in the room. It's, it is this space of being able to walk in. And it's a practice of, of letting go of control, right? Like, it is simply entering the flow of worship in, like, as Zach said, worship that is historical and that has been reflected upon and is not dependent necessarily on the person that's up front right like we can move people in the voices of the different people um to to read the word or to welcome everyone with the lighting of candles and a prayer like it is a beautiful thing to be able to step into a space and say i don't have control here and i'm not being asked to control anything right that space of receiving and just to bear witness to what katie said about intergenerational stuff I was in Richmond a couple weeks ago and a friend said, why don't you should go check out this Compline service at Saints, at this church called St. Stephen's. I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, and you walk into this old stone chapel and it's only lit with candles. And I didn't know what to expect. Like Richmond has a few colleges and universities, but it was this space. What I, what I didn't expect was a bunch of college kids. And that's who kept just streaming in. Wow. To okay. this service of quiet, where there was a six person choir singing from behind us the whole time. And for half an hour, we sat silently together. And it's, it was, it's, it just speaks to the shared experience of, of liturgy and what can happen, I think. Let's uh, talk about the relationship between liturgy and formation. So, Chris, I'm kind of getting back to your area of expertise, but Katie had mentioned this 20 minutes ago. She said, well, one of the reasons we like doing liturgy the way we do it at Wellspring is because it forms us. So weigh in from your perspective as pastor leaders, teachers, worship leaders on the relationship between liturgy and spiritual formation, specifically maybe how it looks in your context. So, Katie, why don't you, you kick us off again? Okay, there's. I, I love talking about this, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, take, you know, take your time, friend. I think, you know, liturgy or just the patterns, the habits that we do. We we all have patterns that form us throughout the week. You know, I'm I'm not a coffee drinker. I'm a tea drinker, but I need my tea every day, and that forms my time. You know, but I think our 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 habits and our our patterns of liturgy, our corporate worship, what they what that does on Sunday is it it teaches us how to be a follower of Jesus the rest of the week. And so first off, we're saying we're doing this communally. 
It's not just individually. So we're participating together. Uh, and even I can come into the room. Maybe I'm in a place of doubt. Maybe I'm really struggling. I don't even have the words to pray. I don't feel close to God. I can't even pray, but I'm actually hearing the voices of the people. They're praying over me. They're speaking the truth of of the word over me, even that's formative because it's the community of faith um, participating together. But I think what the what we do in our liturgy, when it's thoughtfully assembled, when it's comprehensive, uh, it, it teaches us this more robust way to follow the Lord. I don't just pray in times of joy. Um, I also lament or I learn to confess. You know, we do a corporate confession every week. We do a time of prayers of the people where we all have a space in our service where people can pray. You know, it's not just the preacher that prays. We all respond. Or, you know, uh, I think, Chris, you mentioned the passing of the peace. That actually teaches us how to reconcile with one another um, before we come and receive at the table. So I just think we can look at, we can look at each individual piece of our liturgy and how it forms us throughout the week but then I think as in the whole, um, it's the it's this comprehensive understanding of who God is and who we are. Um, and then I haven't even talked about the church calendar, but I've really come to love the church calendar. And if you didn't grow up, I didn't grow up in a liturgical setting, so I'd never thought about the church calendar. But I think that also is, is a part of this conversation of formation, because, um, again, it, it teaches us how to follow the Lord, both in the highs of celebration and the lows of waiting or lamenting um, or being sent out. And so I, I think the, the habits, the patterns, the rituals that we engage in corporately in worship, just they, they, they form us and they teach us. That was great. Thanks. Chris, yeah, please def- wait, weigh in here. This is your area of expertise. Expertise is a really generous word, first of all. <laughs> Two, Zach, did you have something to say before no, you forget? I, I'll go after you. No, go for it. I'll just, again, I feel like I'm in between these two people that I'm just like, I want them to keep talking because it is so <laughs> thoroughly enjoyable. Three people. Sorry, Dr. Lowe. Um, I would I actually, in reflection for this, because uh, it was one of those moments of like, oh, how much have I thought about this recently? Like how up top are these thoughts about liturgy? And so I actually went back to one of these, these resources that first ex- like uh, helped me to gather an understanding of the thoughtful assembly. And is this, there's this music collective, it's called the Porter's Gate now, used to be called Bifrost Arts. And they had this curriculum called Liturgy, Music and Space, right? you could go through. I I found it again today. I haven't looked at it in 13 years. The internet all praises. <laughs> um, but it's just looking back through that, it was just this reminder of liturgy formationally teaches us this new language, this honest and healthy language, like through adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, lament, and commission. The statements become, I love you, I'm sorry, thank you, help me, Amen. why, like why, right? And then what can I do? And so that's the formational part. That's what's resounding with me right now is just like, it teaches us a new and whole and healthy language to experience with God and one another. Great. Thank you. Zach, please weigh in. Identity is a big topic of conversation these days. Yeah, I do think what's uh, given to us in the liturgy is a, a centering of our identity. My favorite liturgical theologians like to talk about worship services as a distillation of all of life. At its best, what a liturgy is doing is trying to help you remember who you are, in Christ especially, So if the scriptures say that my truest identity is found in Christ and as I am united to him in the power of the spirit, you can think that Monday through Saturday is a time where competing identities are coming at me for my allegiance and ultimate affection. And what a Sunday liturgy does is through the pattern of repentance, remind me who I am and whose I am 
Uh, where I found the kind of payout of that is when I first started attending lit more liturgically robust worship services, one of the practices that meant the most to me that I never had growing up was this sequence of confessing my sin and hearing someone declare the gospel to me on the other side of confessing my sin. And very much like what Katie said, when you do that week in and week out, it starts to affect the way you relate to God the other days of the week. What I found is prior to that liturgical formation and ritual, if I ever sort of found myself in a place of really messing up, um, sinning, doing something that needed for me to come clean before the Lord, just my own piety and the way that I was trained to relate to God, I, in a sense, I would, on the other side of that, do my own penance. You know, if, if I had uh, done something wrong, like yeah, I remember this even as a student in school, uh, in elementary school, if I talked in class and the teacher busted me, I would try to atone for what I did by not talking in class for a week. I would try to show God how serious I was uh, and in a sense sort of work out um, my own atonement for my sin. And what this pattern of confession did, especially as my sin got deeper, more serious, more grievous and started hurting a lot of people around me was it started to wear a groove into my soul where upon uh, upon the uh, recognition of my brokenness and need, my instinct, uh, almost Pavlovian, was to get on my knees and uh, come clean before the Lord and come clean before others. And it really became a kind of sixth sense response that in my own head, I was hearing my pastor say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and what I would say is, that reoriented my faith toward a much more gospel-centered, a much more biblical way of relating to God through repentance, as opposed to, in a sense, trying to earn God's favor uh, by doing my own penance. So what the liturgy did for me was form me into a Christian uh, on Monday through Saturday in that very real practice of confession and absolution or confession and assurance. It shaped the way I talked to God. And like what's being said here, when I'm given words that I'm not used to saying before the Lord and they become the pattern of speech on Sunday, I've seen in myself and all my people uh, the way that that leaks into how we talk to and relate to God Monday through Saturday. Right. Uh, we've been talking about liturgy in the context of what I call church world, corporate worship on Sunday or whenever your worship service is. Um, before we get to questions from the audience, because we want to give time to do that, uh, can each of you tell us, tell each other, and tell the people that are watching about the own personal liturgy you follow in order to enhance your spiritual growth and your development in Christ? Katie, you want to start? Yeah, I have two little kids. So figuring out what my own personal liturgy looks like at home is very interruptible in this season. Um, so, you know, and that's why, again, I'm grateful for the rootedness of Sundays because it, uh, we always come back to it. But uh, but I think as what Zach said, that's so true, the um, like learning to confess corporately, that really helps during the week, especially, oh, I've lost patience with my little kids. Let's let's practice confession together. So I think my my personal liturgies, um, really trying to be in the Word, in um, prayer and journaling in the mornings. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a sweet one, but we are we do a Wednesday prayer gathering, and we do communion. And I try to bring communion home to my kids um, afterwards. And so even practicing communion midweek together is kind of a liturgy that we're trying to. Um, do throughout the week as well. So being in the word, continuing to receive, and then kind of practicing what we learn, confession, reconciliation, assurance um, in different ways throughout the week. That's great. Thanks. Chris, what about you? What's your personal liturgical calendar look like? Yeah, like both Katie and Zach, it's a, uh, it's very interrupted with four kids in the house, right? Yeah. And so, but it does, there is space in the morning, you know, and my interaction with that right now is it's been a lot of historically Book of Common Prayer or other prayer books that follow the church year, right? Through Advent, all of it, ordinary time. Um, but there's been this recent, I like, I think liturgy should be a little interruptible, right? Like, because as much as it 
helps frame things and helps us to step into something that is trusted. We should be aware of when we're leaning on it maybe too much or certain aspects of it. And uh, I was recently reminded of when, you know, Mary was at the tomb and turned in the garden and was Jesus. And she, there's one interpretation where she holds him close and he says, um, you got to let me go. You know, and it made me think, in what ways am I holding so tightly that I'm missing kind of what's in front of me? And so kind of with my liturgy, my personal liturgical practices, it is asking myself when I wake up in the morning, okay, what what, what do I want to do right now that involves the word or, or sitting quietly? Uh, and then allowing myself to kind of be pushed by God into creative space. And then familial wise, like Katie mentioned, uh, we just have some questions we ask around the dinner table, which is just, it's a, it's a way to get your kids to participate in the exam, which is what was the best part of your day? What part of your day took the most energy? What's something that you're thankful for? And what's something you want to do differently tomorrow? You know, and it's just four simple questions that Jessica, who I'm married to, we ask them as much for ourselves as we're doing it for the kids, right? It's our way of getting our our liturgy in. So that's what yeah, I'm but you're now. you're you're doing it for yourself and your families, both of you. So that's great. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. Tell us about yourself, please. Yeah, things have gotten really simple for me in in the the prayer book, and it's still available in all the major Anglican prayer books today. There is a model for praying the Psalms over 30 days. So a 30-day Psalm prayer cycle that begins on day one at, at, with Psalm 1. And by day 30, you've hit Psalm 150. And in my, des oh, in can, my desperation. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I think you froze up. A 30-day Psalm cycle is what I do. Um, and I'm not, I, I'm not consistent about it all the time. But I'd say most days I'm praying both the morning and evening Psalms in the morning. Um, I actually have a little, I got a little prayer desk on Amazon that has a little kneeler because I value uh, my body being in a position of submission to the Lord. So I have a kneeler and I have um, a Psalter and I open that up and pray through uh, beginning in Psalm one and just end the day's uh, amount of Psalms. And I've just, I pray that out loud to God. Most times there's no elaboration. Most of the time there's no um, extension of it. And it's been going, this practice has been going for two years for me now, pretty consistently. And it's really overhauled my life. It's been the first consistent devotional practice I've had. Um, and it's, it really has made all the difference in the world. And I would, I commend it to everybody I talk to as the kind of central liturgical practice of your life is to pray God's prayer book to God with his words. That's great. Thanks so much. Okay, Chris, uh, if you want to come on and pose some questions to our panelists from our participants, that would be great, friend. Great. Thank you. I'll start with, does liturgy have limitations or potential downsides? Where have we seen liturgy become overly religious, where we turn people away from what we means to follow Jesus? And I'll add a personal little thing on this. Uh, Scott knows where I grew up in a uh, small town in Canada. I, I couldn't imagine thinking of bringing a, a guy in my sports team into a, a liturgical church up there. So how do we how do we address that problem in today's world? Yeah, I mean, liturgy can feel um, exclusive if you walk in and you feel like everyone else knows something and I don't know something. It can feel rote um, for just going through the motions. And I, I think for, for both of those things, we say, well, it's the Holy spirit that brings life to the liturgy. So we, we, we begin the service, blessed be God, father, son, and Holy spirit. And we're inviting father, son, Holy spirit. Um, we think a lot at wellspring about hospitality with our liturgy. And it's something I'm really passionate about. Our, our other clergy are really passionate about of how do we bring someone along? How do we help someone know, hey, you're you're with us. Let's explain why do we do what we do. If we don't know why we do, if we don't know why we cross ourselves, why do we say this prayer? Why do why does the cross move in the middle of our service? Why do we do any of that? Then it just becomes kind of 
ritual that we go through. But if you understand why we do it, you see there is there is deep intentionality, you know, theology, it's rooted in the scriptures. So we think a lot about how do we explain and bring people along and, and it's an act of hospitality. So even even if they're new and they don't get it, you're you're trying to educate them into what you're trying to yes. do. Yes, Th- yeah. throughout the service, we're, yeah. we want to bring people along and educate and you know, make sure everyone can see yeah. the screen. And we have, a, if you're new, the first thing you're going to get from us is walking through our liturgy. What does it mean? Why do we do it? Great. Chris, Zach, either one of you want to weigh in on limitations or maybe downsides of liturgy? The limitations that um, I think are always possible and are evidenced in liturgical history uh, and in the history of reform uh, are that they're always subject toward a downgrading into mere ritual. Ritual is not the problem, but either turning the ritual into an idol or thinking that one has related to God simply by going through certain uh, ri- ritual incantations or prayers uh, misses the whole point of a relationship with the Lord. So I do find that the liability of liturgy is always needing strong, heartfelt leadership and also just the fresh winds of the Holy Spirit. So I, the the spirit of the Reformation looms large for me when I think of liturgical worship, Sepper, Semper Reformanda. In, yes. in a sense, we're always in need of reformation, whether that's an internal reformation of the heart or reformation of the practices uh, that we're we're going through. And the openness to the spirit's movement of that kind of reformation is is what we need, so that those limitations and liabilities are are met in the in the power of God. Uh, it is, I mean, the whole concept of the Book of Common Prayer. We have to remember was a reform document. The Book of Common Prayer didn't come out of nowhere, and it wasn't merely a, a continuation of ancient liturgies translated into English. There was a huge project that that Cranmer. Uh, embarked upon when he translated Latin to English, and it was to transpose the key of worship I- into something more consonant with the gospel he found uh, elevated and trumpeted in the scriptures. And I I think that's actually one of the most important reforms of any generation is how have we veered away from the good news of Jesus, that is the ultimate forming agent of every Christian, and how do we need to reform worship in and around the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done? Great. Thanks. Chris? I'll just, I'll be brief, as brief as I can. As someone who's like currently looking for a new place to experience liturgy on Sunday mornings, right? Uh, It's been interesting to go in and experience kind of what Zach especially just touched on, which is almost just blowing right through the, the prayers right and through like those aspects and (laughs) wanting to just be like hold on can we just go back so i can catch my breath (laughs) right like like we just kind of passed something and so i think that's personal current experience is one of the limitations is when it does just become okay now we do this thing so we can get to this thing where it's just wrote yes week in a week out okay thanks so much Okay. Yeah, I'm actually actually uh, I'm reminded of a comment that was made by one scholar when he said, and I think it was out it was from C.S. Lewis, where he said sometimes the liability of being in a liturgical environment uh, is because it's it's more in your head. You can be like a man who is admiring himself, admire the sunset. So instead of actually engaging with the Lord, you you're actually engaged in a form of self congratulations that you're so smart, or that you're. you're not one of those kind of evangelicals that's part of that silly worship over there, but you, you end up um, kind of congratulating your own intellectual discovery of something more holy and sacred, and you're admiring yourself rather than admiring Christ. <laughs> Thanks. Great, great word. Thank you. Chris, next question for us. Good. Is there only one true liturgy that in brackets the Kramer Anglican tradition and components or is it even accept, acceptable to just borrow parts of the liturgy? Friends, weigh in. Somebody step to the plate and weigh in on that. Well, I think at its core, the liturgy should have word and sacrament. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I'm I'm in a tradition where where we're not picking and choosing. We're kind of seeing the whole. Now, at yeah. the same time, 
Uh, we use the term local custom. So in an Anglican church, there is some flexibility of what prayers we say. Um, Wellspring is going to feel more low church and charismatic than a different Anglican liturgy, but the the overall movements, the like the the comprehensive whole is going to feel very similar. So from from the tradition I'm in, uh, I think there's a lot of beauty in kind of submitting under the larger thing that we're a part of. What I just heard was word and sac sacrament are indispensable. And I'm going to add in what I heard was prayer as well. Yeah. Okay. Chris, Zach? I'll just, I mean, I'll just echo what Zach said earlier, is that there is liturgy happening within all the gatherings. Right. There is a liturgy present, even if it's sure. not yeah. being recognized as a formal liturgy. Um, also to add that uh, I'll just say I don't know, but I'll defer to Katie and Zach. And, uh, but just be honest, Vic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't believe so at this current moment. Okay, thanks. Zach? Yeah, historically, um, I, I think the answer is, is no. There isn't one true liturgy. There was a huge inquiry done in the 20th century to try to discover the most ancient form and to see whether all liturgical forms stemming from that area of the world were, in a sense, ancestors. And one of the conclusions of uh, preeminent liturgical historian Brian Spinks is that there never was a single uh, a single liturgy or a single kind of liturgical practice, they were always pretty diverse and regionally applied and contextualized based on those things. And so rather, for me, the, the quest is uh, not about, is there one form that's superior to another or one set of prayers, uh, but something actually more fundamental underneath the liturgy and what a, a liturgical theologian, Alexander Schmemann calls the ordo of the liturgy or the deep structure uh, I'm of the conviction that that deep structure is, in fact, the gospel who is Jesus Christ. Um, and that sounds really grandiose and needs a lot of explanation. But I think if there is one liturgy, it is Christ himself. And in a sense, when we're worshiping, we're entering into his, this is going to sound a little mystical, we're entering into his liturgical life. We're entering into his worship uh, of and in Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and that gets into mystical Trinitarian stuff. But I, I think in a way that's where the, the question's ultimately buried is in the life of, of the Godhead. Yeah, I'll just weigh in from my own reading in church history. Uh, there was no singular form of liturgy or worship in the early centuries of the church, partly because the church went so many different places, went way further east, way further south into Africa, than I think we have realized until maybe the last 50, 60 years. And it looked really different in those places. So I don't think there's any singular liturgy. But uh, Chris, I think you had said this earlier, every church, whether it's you know a very low level free church or a very, very high Episcopalian church, every church has a liturgy, but they, they look different. Yeah. So. yeah, 100%. And we all have the liturgies of our lives. Right. Yes, we, we want to. We can take that conversation even further. Like, what are we attuning to during our weeks? Yeah. But just like to, I was just reminded of, you know, in Peterson's rendering in the message where it says Christ put on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. You love it. Yeah. And like that's that's the thing, and that's the context of the liturgies that the three of you just so like wonderfully taught all of us. I, I think we've got about 45 seconds left, so we're not going to do another question, but I'd like each of you to tell us and our participants maybe what you're doing right now, what you're working on, maybe something academic or something just within your own ministry, uh, or maybe something directly related to our discussion today about liturgy. So, Katie, we'll start with you and go around to Zach, and then we'll tie the bow on this. I'm just working on shepherding the flock. I don't have any academic things that I'm currently engaged in. Um, I will uh, encourage, we we have an app out of um, someone, my husband from Wellsprings called the Daily Prayer app. And it actually goes through the four kind of rhythms of the daily office and different prayers. And so that it's a good introduction for someone that's that's trying to figure out how to have a liturgy in their day. Great. Thanks so much. Chris, how about you? 
Yeah, similar, just caring for the people that find their ways into our programs in the Soul Care Initiative at our seasonal retreats and in the Praxis, which is a nine month program for leaders who are uh, hoping to kind of rediscover depth of a life with God through a lot of Ignatian practice and liturgy. So that's that's what's happening. And also right. just trying to stay rested with four kids. Amen. Thank you so much. Zach? Yeah, I don't know how it's happened, but this year I've released two books um, and they're on different ends of the spectrum. The first is called Worship by Faith Alone. And it's an academic book about Cranmer and what he was up to in the 16th century. And the second book is uh, called Before We Gather, and it's meant for pastors and worship leaders to lead their people in pre-service devotionals to prepare their hearts to encounter God in a service. That's great. Well, God bless each of you. Thank you so much for weighing in today and taking the time to do this. I'm sure that all of our participants are deeply grateful. So I'll turn this back over to Chris Johnson and thank each of you again for your time and your help. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.